Quan and Chief escape through a slip space portal, I guess, and they're traveling through slip space. They come out the other end, and then right away they're like speeding through an asteroid belt really dangerously to the point where Quan's freaking out, and it's like, I don't think anybody is chasing you at this point. You've just escaped the portal. I don't think you're being tailed, but you're kind of like rushing past these asteroids dangerously, putting your lives at risk when nothing is chasing you. So it feels like forced tension. That just came off to me as dumb. Especially like right after that where Quan is just like, we're going to die. And Chief driving the Pelican, he says, uh, everything dies. <laughs> it's like, why the fuck would you say that? Why, like, why not say something that puts Quan at ease and then puts you at ease which maximizes your ability to get out of the asteroid safely. Instead, you're going to say something that's like going to maybe throw Quan over the edge, make her panic. Like, I just thought that dialogue is really stupid. That was a laugh out loud moment for me. There's a few laugh out loud moments, quite a few throughout the season where I just burst out laughing and I'm just like, God, really? They're gonna have the character say that or they're gonna do this or like, why is this happening? Like. Just moments of just being baffled by the execution or the plot choices or whatever. Uh, so Chief and Quan land on this rubble place. It's like an asteroid colony. And um, it feels a lot like Total Recall. That little world on Mars. The Mars colony. There's this little beat where uh, Chief and Quan are not greeted um, hospitably. Uh, everyone's kind of like off put by chief's presence and uh this is where soren comes in well in early in the episode we see like a flashback of like young soren and john where soren like escapes the unsc training camp or whatever and john tries to like bring him back in but eventually decides to let him go by faking his gun being jammed gives him like five minutes to escape wasn't enough time to for soren to get out unscathed but he did escape and so they have kind of this uneasy relationship. And Soren is uh, kind of interesting. I like the actor. I think he brings an appropriate amount of like attitude to the role, to the character. He's a good example of like a trope as opposed to a cliche. Because a cliche is just like lazy patterns of things that you see because it's rooted in laziness, right? Because people don't want to like try something new. But when you write a trope, it's there for good reason. Like, tropes keep recurring in media, in stories, because there's something about them that's true or um, has utility. You know, it's repeated for very good reason. And uh, I feel like the role that Soren plays is a good trope. It's the reluctant bodyguard, right? It's like a very skilled warrior who's a bit rusty and is put in this position where they have to be the bodyguard to somebody but they don't really do it but then they're on this kind of journey of liking the person that they're looking after and at first maybe they do it for money but then it eventually becomes about actually because they care about the person you see that in a lot of different media but uh i always like it you know i never i don't really roll my eyes at a trope like that i just i think it's there's some tropes that are kind of cool. And then uh, you compare that with uh, Vincher, right? Who's just like a cliche as opposed to a trope. He's just like this one-dimensional mustache twirling villain who is just bad on a ridiculous level, just shooting innocent people for seemingly no reason sometimes and just has the wardrobe of a bad guy. You know, he's got his big black trench coat and uh, his little fucking round red glasses. You know if a character has those, you know they're a bad guy. And then the cigar smoking and the fucking, the creepy demeanor in which he says all his lines and uh, he's just a bad dude and it's unbelievable that the UNSC would put him in that position as governor of Madrigal, I guess. I don't fucking know what he's doing there exactly. Anyway, so Quan and Chief are on rubble and um, they take these passenger cars to get from one asteroid to another and 
they are ridiculously dangerous because they travel along these cables or no they travel along rails initially when they leave the station they're on a rail and then when they get out into outer space the cart detaches completely from the rail and just floats in space and then there's this little arm on the top of the cable car that hooks onto like a dangling cable that's stretched between two asteroids and so it's like there's a moment where it's not holding on to anything and it's just floating in space freely and then it hooks onto the cable and I'm just like that's so like needlessly dangerous like why wouldn't you engineer it so the cable car seamlessly transitions from the rail onto the cable I mean how hard really would that be to engineer if you've engineered everything else already like why couldn't you just make the cable car work like that maybe it's a nitpick I don't think so because this is like a supposed to be a sci-fi series and when I'm watching sci-fi I'm paying particularly close attention to the technology being used because I expect it to be grounded in reality more so than in other genres I guess right so they're hanging out on rubble and then uh, Soren takes Chief and Quan. they still have the artifact and Soren takes them to see this dude called Reth who's like this guy who used to be a Covenant prisoner and now he's still a prisoner <laughs> but uh, on rubble and they have this like Silence of the Lambs type beat where you know at the beginning of that movie where Clarice is walking past all the lunatics in their cells and then you get to Hannibal Lecter and he's just like weirdly idle and um, well mannered and calm compared to all the other crazies in the prison so I'm thinking they're going to do a similar well if you're going to do a beat like that in this I'm thinking this build up to Reth it's either going to be like he's he does the Hannibal Lecter thing where he's like eerily calm compared to the rest of the prisoners or he's going to be like um, eccentric and unhinged like to like cranked up to 11 compared to all the other prisoners right and that was it felt like the route that they took because he's like always scampering around to a point where it's like unbelievable because if you were scampering around constantly like Reth is always doing you would be exhausted man that actor I think has a tremendous amount of energy that he brings to that character but I just don't think it's written realistically you know you can do crazy and unhinged without like just I keep using the word scampering, but that's just the most fitting word to me. Like, he's just constantly running around and diving and going low to the ground like some feral creature. Um, I just don't really buy it. It's a bit too much. Uh, it was funny with Chief losing layers, because, like, in episode one, he takes his helmet off. In episode two, he takes his suit off not completely like he still has his under armor on and I was thinking like I should make a joke on Twitter about how in episode 3 he'll just be like butt ass naked and then he was they did the joke <laughs> just like oh my god really and it's like what's next is he gonna do goatsy in episode 4 <laughs> we must peel back every layer of this character including his anus in order to really figure out what makes him tick. While Chief is on rubble, he decides to leave Quan there because he doesn't want to deal with Quan anymore. And it's almost like... Yeah, it might as well be the fucking screenwriter putting Quan on an asteroid and then just going off and doing... It's like, okay, now back to the plot of the season. It's like even the screenwriter doesn't seem to hold Quan in much regard. I mean, Quan does end up doing her own thing, with Soren, but it's like completely divorced from Chief and only ties in with Chief's story in a very artificial way by way of the assault rifle that was planted in the outpost on Madrigal for no reason <laughs> other than fan service, I guess. Or just like trying to make Quan's storyline significant more than it is by tying it in with Chief's storyline because Chief left the assault rifle for her to use that somehow redeems the presence of her plotline and I just don't think it does. So among the Covenant is this character called McKee who is a human. You're not really meant 
to be sure uh, where her allegiances are because she's obviously with the Covenant being treated apparently like royalty uh, but she in the first beat that we see her in I think she's like reading this book of human stories and uh, this prophet is like uh, you read those stories because um, you want to not because you connect with your humankind but because you want to understand your enemy better so that you so that you may more effectively destroy them that kind of thing and but the book is obviously there to make the audience go like oh maybe it could be one or the other we are not really sure about this character yet but it's just a little too baffling because like we've seen that the covenant just want to mercilessly eradicate humankind apparently but then there's just this one human that stands out and it's like why why are they treating her like royalty instead of just keeping her in a prison cell somewhere but then i guess they're like conditioning her to like more likely serve their interests i guess so i guess they feel that'll be easier if they treat her like one of their own but uh, I don't know why she's not more suspicious, given their hatred for every other human being. I don't know why the elites have nothing to say about it, apparently. They're just willing to go along with the fact that um, McKee is there. and uh, Or maybe they've all been told why she's really there, because they're obviously they're using her. And um, I don't know, there's just something about the execution that didn't feel right. Uh, it was a little too odd. I think mix in, mixed into that is the absence of Arbiter, and it's just like, why are we seeing McKee and Arbiter's nowhere to be found? Like, you're not going to set that character up instead to be on the alien side of things. And I got no problem with the actress that plays McKee. I think she's quite good. I also don't mind the idea of, like, a woman alien assassin type character because she has this weird energy sword finger that made a bunch of people laugh and it made me laugh as well but I'm trying to think why I laughed at that beat and if it could be executed better like maybe if it was a wrist mounted thing instead of like a fingernail that generates a little energy sword I think that's what's funny about it it's like an energy sword recognizable from the games but shrunk down comically to fit into a finger. I don't mind the idea of a character like that having a concealed blade you know what I mean but maybe it could have been done a little bit differently. Maybe not a fingernail. Uh, there's a scene where we see McKee as a kid. And she's like with this boy kid. And she like kisses the boy after reading about kissing in the book or something. And it's meant to be like kind of a tender moment. And then they kind of... They get chased down by these comically villainous guards or police or paramilitary whatever. It's like they go around tasing children <laughs> they see the kids kissing and they're like hey stop having a good time over there you little bastard <laughs> and then they chase the kids down to like tase them with like cattle prods or whatever they have these electric things and uh it seems a little over the top you know like none of these humans have any qualm about tasing innocent children and just using swearing needlessly like they literally say like come here you little shit or something like that like it's just kind of cringe and the tasing isn't very convincing because like the kids they're getting tased and they're just like ah uh, uh. <laughs> I don't know I wasn't convinced by the uh, tasing but I guess you can't expect too much from child actors, I guess. It was fine, I suppose. Uh, but in the same scene, the kid, McKee as a kid, is found by the aliens who have these glow sticks and it glows glowy when, <laughs> whenever it's in the proximity of what the show refers to as blessed ones. And uh, what determines whether or not you are a blessed one and can therefore interact with forerunner technology, I guess, is a billion to one genetic deformity. Uh, I don't know if you have to be human, because the only condition in the games to interact with forerunner technology is that you're human. Any human can interact with the stuff. 
and uh, Halo 3 played with that in terms of plot and tension uh, when the Brutes, I think, they capture Miranda and Keys with the intent of using them to activate the Forerunner tech to activate all the Halos to destroy the universe or whatever, but they don't see it that way. The Covenant think this is like paving the great way forward for the great journey or whatever, like a, a step of evolution, I guess. And uh, it's like, what about these sticks? Is it that uh, finds blessed ones, like knows how to glow in their presence? Like, I don't really understand that, but whatever. The glow sticks identify blessed ones. That's how the aliens found her. And they figured, you know, they can use her to activate the halo. But until then, we'll treat her like one of our own. But uh, I think she's unrealistically, like, unsuspicious of the whole situation, I guess. Uh. I guess because the humans on that garbage colony or whatever were so mean to her that that's why she was very easily able to, like... Um, find stability living with the aliens because they were treating her relatively well. Sometimes there's like dumb fluff dialogue. Like eventually the prophets, they find that the humans have found the artifact and then they send McKee to go get it. And there's like a scene where one of the prophets approaches uh, McKee and says, uh, I remember something like, I remember when you were a child, but you were much smaller then. And it's like, no shit. Why, why even have that line in there? And the answer is because you need a beat of dialogue, I guess, for during that period of blocking where the alien is entering the room and it's just like they need to be more disciplined with the dialogue writing I think just get rid of fluff like that you don't need a line like that that's dumb so in order to help her attack this UNSC ship in order to find the location of the artifact I think she recruits the help of the worms that compose the hunter enemies from the video games and it's so quick in the show that I almost missed it. But it's like the one glimpse that you get of the hunter enemies. And usually in the games you see them in pairs. But there's just this one hunter in this one instance. And you don't even... In one shot. But you don't even see the hunter's full body. You just see the hunter's foot. And the worms sort of come out of his body. Or like the worms are the body. And the worms just kind of come apart from inside the boot and it's like why don't you just show the full hunter why not show a pair of hunters like I don't think there's hunters shown in any other shot throughout the entire season at all like it just seemed weird not to like incorporate the hunters more overall we just see that one boot shot it's kind of weird I liked her using the worms though I thought that was kind of cool but it's just like why not just have two hunters go in there and just wreck the whole place you know and then McKee can walk in and get what she needs. So, Chief leaves Quan on rubble. And then he goes uh, back to the UNSC, back to Halsey. Takes the artifact with him. Halsey studies the artifact, studies Chief. And uh, we see some past scenes where Halsey first found John. And... Um, if I was writing the Halo show, I would be tempted to start off the show with that, you know? Um, do, like, a in-media res thing with, like, Chief in an action scene still. Do that, but intercut that maybe with um, the scene where Halsey first talks to John as a kid. And, like, do that scene not in, like, a really segmented flashback sort of way but just like in a scene where it's given plenty of room to breathe and it feels like an organic scene that's not rushed um, but I don't know that's just my thoughts on that there's actually things I quite like about the scene where Halsey discovers child John in the show just in the way it structures its reveals because in the first 
shots of the scene, you just see a bunch of kids playing, and it's like a cold open, and you don't really know where we are or what's going on yet. But then you see like this adult figure who's talking about the kids uh, in this context that this is like an orphanage, I think, slash training facility or something. You see she's talking to somebody, presumably prospective parents, but you don't know who yet. And then you reveal that it's Halsey, right? And there's some dramatic irony here because you know that she's there not for the reasons that she's saying she is. Like, because we know from prior scenes with Halsey what her motivations are. And so we know that she's not being entirely forthright in this scene because she's posing as like a parent looking for a kid, I think. And then you reveal that Keys is with her. So he's kind of involved in the Spartan program. And you can now understand, like, he probably has some regrets about, like, his contribution to the war effort by being a part of this controversial Spartan program that involves kidnapping children and augmenting them and breaking their bones and shit. Which is actually something I wish the show focused a little bit more on. Because that was what I really liked. One of the things I liked about the book Fall of Reach is that it really got into a lot of detail about the experience that the kids went through in order to become Spartans and how brutal it is, which is really important to the thematic, right? Because it ties into that theme of the cost of humanity on the individual. If the Spartan program wins the war, can you call it a victory when it came at the cost of destroying all these families, right? Taking children away from their parents, replacing them with flash clones that are genetically disposed to expire after X amount of time to make it look like a natural death. Anyway, Halsey finds child John because like there's this situation with kids on this bridge between two trees or something and some kid falls off the bridge and John saves him and that's enough for Halsey to look at John and be like, that's the kid I want. Like that's what I'm looking for, I guess. The special, he has the secret sauce that I need for my Spartan program and it's like, well, what just because he saved the kid from falling like i feel like there should have been a little more moral complexity to that um situation in that scene with the kids to make halsey like something a little more profound about john's character to make halsey have that reaction where she's like him i gotta have him um it feels like just saving some kid who almost fell isn't enough like I think it would be more interesting if like the kid prior in the scene had like wronged John somehow or was like bullying to him or another kid but then in spite of that kid being a shithead he fell and John chose to save him anyway which would speak much more greatly to John's character right so it would be more believable that Halsey would see something remarkable in him. Uh, so now we start hearing stuff about the Cortana program or getting into a little bit more detail about it now. This is this program that Halsey wants to start where she integrates her Spartans with this AI system she's developing that's based off of her own personality. And once Cortana and her Spartans are integrated fully in the way that she envisions that this will create the ultimate soldier and will be the key to winning the war, I guess. And uh, I kind of like the way... I'm not always impressed with the cinematography, but I do like how some scenes in particular are shot. Um, one of those scenes is the political like roundtable scene where all these like talking um, administrative heads are gathered around a table talking about the current status of the war and Halsey's Cortana program stuff and Halsey's talking about Cortana and um, it's one of those scenes where it's like the dialogue uh, and all the characters present is kind of telling you one thing it's telling you one story but the real story is what the shots are telling you and that's emphasizing the um, conflict between Halsey and Admiral Perengoski, I think, in a way that the dialogue isn't, right? So the shots are telling you that they have this conflict with one another. They're butting heads. Like, Perengoski doesn't have much faith in Halsey in the Cortana program, but she's kind of tolerating her for now, I guess, 
And Halsey kind of knows this about Perengoski and sees Perengoski as something of an obstacle to her ambitions. Um, but none of that is in the dialogue because they don't want to make that um, conflict explicit. But it's there in the way it's shot because you have these like intimate um, coverage shots and overs between um, uh, Perengoski and Halsey, right? So I like that in scenes where the dialogue's doing one thing and the visuals are doing another thing, and they're uh, in contrast with one another. I appreciated that. Regarding um, Halsey's clone that she uses to make Cortana, I don't really understand why a clone or a brain needs to be harvested and sacrificed in order to build Cortana. I don't understand why Halsey can't just scan her brain, her own brain, not a clone brain, but just her brain, and then just make Cortana out of that digital scan. I don't, like, do you need a living brain to be incinerated in order to create this AI thing? Like, I feel that's just an unnecessary stepping stone that's being put into the process to um, make it needlessly morally complicated more than it needs to be, you know? It's like forcing moral complexity, I guess, you know? Where it's like, oh, what are the ethics of, like, sacrificing a clone, harvesting a clone? And it's like, well, would you even really need to do that if you're doing something like this? And I don't know. It just feels a little forced. I also didn't really like the execution of the clone because I feel like she's too content with the situation. There's a movie called The Prestige with Hugh Jackman and uh, Christian Bale. It's a fucking awesome movie. It's about two magicians who are trying to like outperform one another in like putting on the best magician show. And... Uh, Hugh Jackman's magician character gets a hold of this technology from Nikola Tesla that allows him to create a clone of himself. So the idea is to do like a teleportation trick. But in the process of doing that, what that involves is actually creating a real clone that gets killed. That is like set up to be killed immediately after. But the dilemma with the clone creation is that every time Hugh clones himself, he doesn't know whether his soul... I guess if you want to think of it that way, is going to be within the body that was cloned or the newly created clone. And any instance where the clone is created, because there's more, there's always clones being created, he could be either one or the other. And if he's in the other, if he happens to be in that position, he knows he's going to get killed or drowned or shot. And there's this great scene where he first creates a clone of himself. And... The clone doesn't think of himself as a clone. He thinks of himself as the original. The clone Hugh Jackman, who thinks he's the original, is looking over at the real original, thinking, there must be some mistake here. I'm the original, I just got switched over here. But the original has a gun next to him in the event that he has to shoot the clone. And he does that. And it's actually like a really quick but terrifying beat where you just have this kind of uh, existential... Uh, epiphany I guess this all these ideas of self and what makes the soul and what makes an individual all are just they hit you all at once and it's just, there's this moment of panic where it's just like oh my god I gotta kill this thing boom and it's like you're not even thinking of it as a human being at that point it's just like I gotta kill this thing boom now it's dead we're fine but holy shit I feel like uh, it should have been more like that in the show where that could have been really interesting, where the Halsey clone kind of thinks of herself as the original, and there must be some kind of mistake, and maybe she tries to escape or something. But then I don't really understand the need for a clone being harvested in the first place. So Halsey has this assistant known as Creepy Scientist Man, and Creepy Scientist Man is working on Halsey's clone, and he's injecting her with something. And there's this beat where he seems to take pleasure in the fact that he's about to administer pain onto this clone with the shot because she asks, like, if it's going to hurt. And he's like, oh, yes, in this really creepy way where he's also kind of holding the syringe up. And it's just like, are you enjoying this or what's going on? Like, why are you setting this character up to be creepy? Um, I don't really understand why. 
I think I know why now, because in the finale he gets killed by Spartan Kai, and I guess it's just that setup was just to make the audience in that last beat where he gets killed go, yay, Spartan killed creepy guy, and it's okay because he's creepy and he deserves to die, I guess. But I don't really know what it was doing with the creep factor beyond that. It just seems pretty shallow. In the games, Cortana is on a chip that Chief plugs into his helmet and then that's how Cortana is activated and integrated with his systems and all that and she can hear him he can hear her uh, but in the show they decided to go the neural implant route so they inject a thing in Chief's brain that like produces Cortana but then it's like confusing because I don't really understand the technology that's involved in the projection of Cortana because it's a brain implant, right? So you would think like when Cortana manifests herself, it's only for Chief. Only he can see her. Only he can hear her, right? Because it's a neural implant. But the show treats it as if anybody can see Cortana and anybody can hear Cortana. So if that's true then you have to wonder where is where are the pixels coming from where is this hologram being generated from is there like a a hologram generator somewhere on chief's suit that's kind of projecting this out for everybody else to see where is the audio coming from it can't just be coming from the pixels so is there like a speaker on chief's suit is that where the audio is coming from because it can't be coming from the pixelated avatar right that doesn't make sense and might seem like a nitpick again but I'm sorry this is like a this is supposed to be a grounded sci-fi and when I'm watching grounded sci-fi I'm going to think more about the technology and how it works in a way that I wouldn't when I'm watching other genres like it doesn't have to be I don't have to understand completely how it works because you're obviously when you're telling stories in the future you're gonna make up some stuff right but I do expect to understand some basics, like just for instance, where the audio and video of Cortana is coming from in regard to like other people, not Chief, being able to see and hear her. Like it doesn't make sense. I'm trying to make sense of it and my brain just throws up an error message and it's like they didn't think about it carefully enough. But there's a bunch of technology in the show that doesn't make sense. Like there's that weird hologram eavesdropping tool that they use where they go into this room and lie down like inception and they plug this stupid thing on their forehead and they lie down and they're like in a comatose state i guess or asleep or something or maybe they're just closing their eyes and chilling out but then while they're doing this and they have this dumb thing on their forehead it lets them walk around as a digital avatar that can't be seen to anybody else, unlike Cortana, for some reason. And they can just walk into any room and eavesdrop on any conversation. And uh, as an avatar that nobody can see or hear. And you know that's what they're doing because of the way they shoot it. Like, they're present in some shots, but in other shots they're not in the same scene. Because we're meant to as an audience we're supposed to see that and go like oh, okay they can see themselves holograms can interact with each other but no one else can see or hear them but then how can the holograms hear and see what's going on in other rooms where are they getting the audio and video from those rooms is it from cameras and microphones in the rooms because we know later with the way McKee is held and not monitored at all by any kind of electronics which is dumb that they don't have cameras or microphones in there so where is the audio and video being sourced from for the people in those chairs using those avatars to be able to see and hear what's going on like it doesn't make sense like if you just think about it for a second <laughs> if you just think about it for a second you're just like wait that, that's stupid but I think most people are just willing to gloss over something like that and I'm sorry, that's just... I'm willing to forgive some things. That is a little bit too much of a stretch for me where I just, I can't... It just doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. Like, where... 
I mean, you're you're asking me to neglect very the very basics of like audio and video recording. I wouldn't put this kind of emphasis on the technology making sense, like I said, in a different genre, like not sci-fi. Uh, but because it's sci-fi, I'm going to pay extra attention to the technology. And if I can't even understand how it works on a very, on the most basic level, there's a problem. And you didn't think, you didn't think about it thoroughly enough. And this is a less gratuitous example, but there's these like bio readers that it's just like a big hole in a wall that you stick your hand in. Chief usually does it. And it's like, it wants you to identify yourself. So Chief sticks his arm in and he's like, Petty Officer John 117. And I think the machine is even like, please identify yourself. But it's like, presumably you're connecting to a machine that's connected to the UNSC network. And the machine is reading your bio signatures. So wouldn't it like know who you are already? What's the necessity for announcing your identity to this computer every time you do this? That seems kind of stupid. Just a bunch of shit like that, that it feels like they didn't really think through how this works exactly. And I feel like they were obligated to put a bit more effort into that. So I think the reason they made Cortana a neural implant is um, because they knew they were going to have the helmet off a lot for this at least first season. Probably much more throughout um, future seasons. And uh, they knew if Cortana was on a chip that plugs into the helmet and the helmet's always coming off, then they're not going to be able to manifest Cortana whenever they want. But if it's a brain implant, that means Cortana can manifest anywhere. But you would think it would be only for Chief in that case. But like I said, everyone can see and hear Cortana's projections, so it's a little bit weird. But uh, by going that route, you lock yourself out. The writers do. They lock themselves out of being able to play with the tension of the chip being separated from Chief's helmet, right? So like in the opening cutscene of Halo Infinite, for example, the Cortana's chip gets knocked out of Chief's head. And then it's like separate from the suit and Chief has to like go get it. So it's playing with that narrative tension of him being separated from Cortana and he has to like go get it. So if the show had done the chip method, you could have had like some stretch of episodes where Chief loses the chip and he has to go and get it back. You can't do that now because you've made it a brain implant. Jen Taylor is always good at Cortana's voice. She always does a great job. She's been with the franchise for a very long time. I respect all the work that she's done for all the games and in the show. She's one of the elements of the show that I think is grounding it uh, in terms of like fans of the games being able to see things that are recognizable, you know? Like, she's one of the things that makes it feel like Halo. And, uh... She does a great job. Uh. I think the way Cortana looks is kind of weird. I don't know why they went with a flesh tone. Her face looks a bit odd. Not like ugly, but she looks kind of young and old at the same time. It's kind of uncanny. But uh, I guess that's kind of the point, maybe. But uh, I don't know why they couldn't just do like the digital blue skin tone like the games um, but whatever not a big deal I think the execution of Cortana as a character overall is shaky again no problem with Jen Taylor's voice but the way she's written um, especially at the beginning like her initial interactions with Chief it comes off as a, a little too like it's weird because in one sense I want the show to be more to have more levity, to be like more fun for there to be more jokes, but Cortana, I feel, is like introduced as too much of an annoyance. It reminded me of Alexa from South Park, where she's just this like bitchy girlfriend that <laughs> keeps showing up um, to like intrude on conversations and stuff. A very intrusive like presence. Alexa, set a course for South Park Mental Asylum. Do you ever think about how the way you act affects other people? It's like, why would you have a system like this to help you in battle? Like, this is the last thing you want. 
and so it's like a little too comical in that regard I feel like they should have not been so much at odds initially but I don't know maybe that that's the wrong way to do it maybe given what they were trying to do maybe that was the correct the best way that they could have done it I'm really it's hard to say it's like there's this there's a bunch of scenes where like Chief's trying to have a conversation and Cortana will just like pop in it's almost as if like Chief is seeing a girl who he doesn't really want to introduce to anybody as his girlfriend but that's what Cortana's trying to do and he's just like Cortana shut up it's like a little bit like that um, and it comes off as a little too corny I don't know I could be contradicting myself here because I, I do love the comedic banter that they have in the games but uh, I feel like it's better written, better executed in the games. What about that scare? We've all run the simulations. They're tough, but they ain't invincible. Stay with the Master Chief. You'll know what to do. Yes, sir, Sergeant. Thanks for the tank. He never gets me anything. Oh, I know what the ladies like. Because in the games, you never get the sense that Cortana is like an obstruction, like a comical hindrance that's just like in the way. I feel like that's what Cortana initially is in the show, but the show eventually does handle that a bit better. Really not until the very end though, I think. I do like the scene though where Chief kind of becomes more accepting of Cortana because she helps him narrow down the planets where he's getting his visions from. Or, well, he's getting his visions from the artifact, but what he's seeing, like he doesn't know where the visions are taking place. The environment that he's seeing, he doesn't know where it is. And Cortana helps him narrow it down based on, like, the plant life and what he can hear in the visions, I guess. Or something like that. But it's just, like, Chief all of a sudden realizes, and the audience realizes, just what uh, utility Cortana really provides. Like, having access to all these data points simultaneously in real time. And being able to make these massive calculations to give Chief um, critical information in the moment that he needs it in order to act efficiently and achieve objectives drastically faster than he would without her right so like i said um chief and the other spartans all have a chip in their ass not really it's a chip placed at the base of their spines and it influences their brains by suppressing their emotions to make them more tactical fighters who exclude emotion from their combat decision making and um chief decides to remove the pellet and Catherine Halsey is okay with this I guess and lets Cortana help him do it and so chief performs spinal surgery on himself with a knife by staring into like a bathroom mirror and it's just like this is so ridiculously dangerous but I guess you can't have like a robot do it because it's against UNSC protocol, but like maybe that's why he has to do it himself, but it's just dumb and risky. And Cortana is giving him instruction. She's kind of like eyeballing it. And she's saying like, make a, she says like, make a centimeter and a half incision or something, but she doesn't specify the direction. So Chief is just like, well, I guess he just guesses what direction uh, he thinks she means. But it's like, why would you take a risk? Why would you risk cutting in the wrong direction when you're sticking a knife into the base of your own spine? <laughs> it's just kind of ridiculous. And I think the reason he removed the pellet while standing upright is because it would look too stupid if he was face down, butt up on like a medical bed, you know? Or if he was like <laughs> covered in like medical sheets except for his little bare ass like poking out of a little square <laughs> that'd be so funny so he takes the pellet out and I forget how but Kai does the same thing she's like one of the girl Spartans and she takes it out and she's just like wow this is great I'm feeling all these things and she dyes her hair pink with like gun grease or something and it's like, why would you give yourself away? Obviously, the higher-ups and, 
like whoever's involved with the program are going to see that and recognize that the emotional suppressant is isn't working as it should and it's probably something to do with the pellet and they're going to realize that she took the pellet out and then they'll put it back in so why give yourself away like that oh i don't care i've got to express myself through my hair color that's uh, a little stupid and i didn't like chief's hypocrisy because like kai goes up to chief and she's like hey i took mine out too like this is awesome and chief is like you're grounded you can't you can't go fight but i'm gonna go fight even though i did the same thing <laughs> And it's like, well, you trust yourself, but you don't trust uh, another Spartan, even though they're doing the exact same thing you did. Like, have maybe you should have a little faith in your fellow Spartans, especially if you're supposed to have this, like, bond with them, which I really don't buy. That's one of the problems with this show is that I don't really, I don't really sense any real emotional cohesion between the members of Silver Team. And we should, right? I mean, the show kind of expects us to have that, but it's just not there because they haven't put the time into building that relationship, which is why I think they should have spent a little more time with them as kids going through the procedure. Like, I would have done, like, maybe a whole episode about that, you know? That would really solidify that bond, and it would really it would make a lot of the plot later on between the Spartans more compelling, especially like when they're all fighting in the gym and stuff. Chief and Halsey are doing some shit with the artifact. They're playing around with it. Chief touches it some more. He gets some more visions. He finds out where he has to go. Cortana helps him narrow it down. And then he tells Halsey, I think, like, I know where we have to go. Uh, the place where I grew up. Eridnus 2, I think the planet is. So they go there. And then they do this thing where he puts... He's had his helmet off for some time now, right? And he puts it back on finally. And it's like the audience, presumably, like I was, is going, great. We're going to have... We had a chunk of episodes where he's had his helmet off. We get to see Human Chief for a while. Now he's put the helmet back on. They're making... They're visually punctuating the moment. So... It seems like they're going to stick with this for a while now. And we're going to see some helmeted chief action for a while. And so he drives in a Warhawk for about 20 seconds of screen time. Stops the vehicle, gets out, and he takes the helmet off again. And it's like, it's almost like they're trolling the audience. You know what I mean? It's like, we know you want to see this, but oh, surprise, here's Pablo's face again. And it's like... <laughs> like, why even fuck I don't know like I understand putting it on before you go for a drive because you want that data uh, constantly in real time as you're driving in order to like make the drive safe right you can be aware more aware of any threats than you would be if you had the helmet off the whole drive but then as soon as he gets out he takes the helmet off again and it's like why don't you just keep it on like that way you can keep an eye out for threats and get like diagnostic suit information and whatever any threat analysis if there's something that shows up in your radar I mean remember it's if it's supposed to be like the games right they have the radar in the bottom corner you would always want to keep an eye on that right if you see a red dot it's just like oh shit I didn't hear anything but it looks like the mo the suit is detecting motion from over there that I wouldn't have known about had I not had the helmet on so like it's not always it's makes sense a lot of the time for him to be keeping the helmet on more than to take it off you know that bugs me but whatever he takes it off and then this is like near his old house and he's like digging up his old drawings and it's like why why are they buried under the ground like his parents made him bury all his doodles in his stupid drawings <laughs> And it's like, why don't you just, like, burn them or throw them in the garbage or something? Like, did you really have to bury them under the ground? Like, is the idea to preserve them? Who are you preserving them for? Who do you want to find this later? I guess Chief, because he ends up digging it up. So it's just, like, just for the sake of the making the script work, you know? So then we have this beat. They're, like, searching for more clues as to how where the exact location of the new artifact they're looking for is because there's two of them they found the first one and then there's another one on this planet somewhere and then they're looking through John's old house and 
this is a moment where he puts the helmet back on because he needs the helmet's um, augmented reality interface to digitally reconstruct his old home and with the help of Cortana um, based on his own recollection because Cortana's like reading his brain I guess and um, he's like doing this tour of his house and there is not one but two in helmet camera angles uh, where we're looking at Chief's face it feels like the showrunners are so scared of keeping Chief's helmet on for too long because they're worried for some reason that the audience is going to be alienated from the character they're not going to be able to connect with Chief if he's always got his helmet on which I don't think is the right way of looking at it I think the showrunners have got that totally backwards well not backwards but like they're underestimating the degree to which a helmeted character can convey emotion constantly you don't and you don't need sure have him take his helmet off sometimes I don't care but like I think they're thinking like whenever he has his helmet on that means the audience isn't connecting and I don't think that's the right way to look at it so he puts his helmet on and we get two separate angles one is the Iron Man one where it's like straight on his face you see kind of his HUD elements around him around his face and then there's another angle where it's like here where it's accentuating one eye and we kind of see partially out through his visor of his helmet and uh, it's like why do we need two angles couldn't you just stick with one like don't even I wish they didn't even cut to an angle inside his helmet at all we don't need to see his face here R really I don't think I think it, this scene would be much more effective if the camera just hung back and you're just seeing helmeted chief look around and you're kind of wondering what he's thinking but the body language is informing you a little bit and I think that's all you need and there's something to that ambiguity of what's going on underneath his helmet that I think really works if you just leave it and you let it just play you know um, but the showrunners aren't looking at it that way it's like we gotta see his face we gotta see his face and that just kind of ruins it. It doesn't ruin it, but I think the execution is poorer than it could be, you know?